thank you for tuning into our sermon today. We love God's word here at Cross Life, and we hope that you will be both blessed and challenged by the message. Well, good morning, Cross Life. How are you doing today? All right. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. It is a blessed day already because of what we've seen and heard and sung about today. It is an amazing day. We, as you can see, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper today. Who here, raise your hand, if you took advantage of that great opportunity before all this inflation hit, uh, the deflation that took place, and had an opportunity to refinance your house? Uh, only a couple, only a few, I'm surprised. Well, may, I tell you what, I think we're, we're under four, right, in our percentage. Our, our percentage on housing, on our, on our refinance was under 4%. Amazing how much money we are saving over, over the period of time of our mortgage. It is an incredible, incredible refinance. A, a new contract was put in place, and the old one was gone. How about, how about those contracts those professional athletes get? right? They get some, some new contracts. Did you, did you know that Cincinnati quarterback Joe Burrow is the highest paid NFL player at $62.9 million a year? <laughs> Amazing contract. And somebody will get another one higher than that, all right? Today in our message, it is about a contract, if you will, a covenant, a new covenant that is put in place that is far, far better than any refinance or any athletic competition contract that you can ever get. It is an amazing, amazing blessing about the new covenant that we're going to learn about today. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open to chapter 22 of the book of Luke. We'll be looking at verses 7 through 20. The message today is entitled, Enter the New Covenant. Enter the New Covenant. Let me, if I can, kind of set up the scene, if I will. The, Jesus is at the end of his public ministry, if you will, and he, the climax of everything that he's done for the past three years is starting in these verses that we're reading today. He even says in verse 15 that he had, he had desired earnestly to celebrate this Passover meal with his disciples. This is a pivotal moment in his life. And the thing is, he knows what lays ahead of him. He knows about this right before him. But he wants to celebrate with his disciples. He wants the teaching to take place. He, 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 all this teaching has been laid down before the foundation of the earth and has been prophesied and will be taking place in these very moments that we're just about to read. The old Mosaic covenant which brought Israel to this place, the, essence, the, the sacrificial system for the forgiveness of sins is now coming to an end. The old covenant is ending, and the new covenant is being ushered in by Jesus himself. The ceremony that has been in place literally for thousands of years, okay, the covenant of freedom being replaced with this, again, new ceremony and a new covenant that will lead God's people until he comes again. This covenant will be in place until God returns. This, friends, is an historic moment, certainly in the life and ministry of Jesus. Last week when we were meeting, we met together and we talked about the betrayer, Judas, and the betrayal that would take place in just a few hours. Now the focus is on the new covenant being established, honoring and celebrating the past, but again, ushering in the new. So let me read, starting in verse 7. It'll be on the screen. Follow along in your Bibles as well. Then, he came, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat 
the Passover with my disciples. And he, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at table and his apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Pray with me, if you will. Father God, these words have lasted the, the test of time for 2,000 years. These words have been repeated over and over again in remembrance of this incredible moment in time and what is about to take place on the cross and in the grave. The changing and ushering in of a new covenant agreement that brings together the family of the God the way you Father, have intended and wanted to from the beginning. And so, Lord, as we study this text today, let it reign in our hearts. Let our hearts be open to all that you have for us to learn and experience today. And the church says, amen. A few comments uh, over verses 7 through 13 I want to make. We talked last week about the, the celebration of the Passover or the Celebration was referred to as the unleavened bread. These two celebrations are pretty much kind of interchangeable. There's, there, there's some nuanced differences, but essentially it's one big celebration. It's the Passover meal that celebrates the release of, of the Jews from Egypt, okay, and what happened that first night. One of the things they had to do that first night was a sacrificial lamb, but they also had to bake unleavened bread, bread without yeast. There was no time for them, so the yeast take time to rise. You couldn't use it. Now, what I found interesting too is when Moses got this edict that the Passover situation was going to happen. Okay, and if you don't know what the Passover is, again, the Christ's death or the death angel comes over the house of of Egypt and the house of the Jews, but the Jews have painted their doorpost with a blood of a one-year-old perfect lamb, and it passes over them, and they don't die. But for the Egyptian, the firstborn of male person and animal dies. And so they're celebrating this. But I found it interesting that there's like a million Jews, okay, during this time, almost a million of them in Egypt, and he got the word out in 10 days. <laughs> Without Twitter, without Facebook, he got it out in 10 days. I just thought that was kind of, kind of amazing. But we do understand that this leaven also represents sin, right? It, it, it is a, a representation of sin as well. The Passover, when it is eaten, it's on that first evening they celebrate. It, it, we, we refer to it... it as this, a Seder meal, the meal itself is called a Seder, which literally just means order, because there is a specific order uh, of how things are go. There's special blessings, there's special prayers, there's stories that are told, there's questions that are asked, there's songs that get sung, and it's all laid out very specifically on how they perform the Passover or the Seder meal. I, I'm always, though, amazed uh, at Luke and his gospel. Again, a, a, a Gentile writer who I believe got most of his information, I think, from, the, from John and Mary, to be honest with you, but that's my, my opinion. 
Luke, though, is the only one that mentions here that it was specifically Peter and John that he told to go get the Passover meal ready. The other ones just say it's the disciples. But I found the whole situation rather interesting, to say the least, the way this whole thing came about, right? That you're going to find this man carrying water in the town, and then you're going to follow this guy, and then when he gets to a house, go ask the master of the house, hey, where's the room? Rabbi, uh, teacher wants to to have the Passover meal. I mean, uh, it's kind of strange. And one of the strangest things is that a man would not have been carrying water. (laughs) That was woman's work, believe it or not. But that was kind of the, the sign, if you will, that, oh, there's a guy carrying water today. We better follow this guy. So they could pick him out of the crowd pretty easily. But all that to say is it just seems like a very strange request to begin with. But that's, it happens exactly the way Jesus said it would happen. Now, was this a miracle of Jesus? Or did Jesus preset this whole thing up? <laughs> I don't know. I can be honest with you. I like to think that Jesus, uh, he certainly could have, this could have been a miracle of Jesus, but nonetheless, it takes place, and everything is as Jesus said it would be, and so they prepare. They have to prepare by going to the temple and getting a, a lamb and having it slaughtered by the priest, okay? That, now, whether they had their own little Bo Peep sheep with them or they had to buy one, I don't know. But they did this. This is part of the, the, the setup. They had to get the lamb sacrificed at the temple, so they, they did that. They get the rest of the supplies and things that needed to be there for the supper that night. And then you go into verse 14. Verse 14 opens the picture of the upper room being and taking place. Jesus is going to share the most significant proclamation to date. He is going to literally end the Mosaic covenant and set that was set in place with the law, and specifically this ceremony of the Passover, also the ceremony of what is we call Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, which is the one sacrifice for all the sins of Israel that happened year after year after year on the same date. All that's changing. And in hindsight, we know now that there's There was a purpose for God setting up that system to begin with, right? That whole sacrificial system that they lived under for over a thousand years was set up with a great purpose. One of the purposes we need to know and understand from Scripture is that it was set up for us to, it was to expose our sinfulness, to be quite honest with you, that we needed a Savior. And more importantly, that the whole system was inefficient. It was inefficient. The Day of Atonement had to happen every year, year after year after year, to to satisfy the the holiness of God. It only lasted a year. And even with that, when you you sinned, you were required multiple times of the year to go to the temple, and depending on what the sin was, there was was special offerings that had to take place. And so again, I sin one day, I go to the temple, I sin next week, I go to the temple, you know, the whole system is given to us for the fact that it shows its own insufficiency. In the book of Hebrews, which is a New Testament book, by the way, it's not in the Old Testament, it talks about this whole idea and that the Mosaic Covenant was, he calls it a shadow of things to come. Listen to what he says in verse 1 of chapter 10, he says, For since the law has but a shadow of things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The whole sacrificial system It was a shadow of things to come. What is about to come in the next few moments, the next few hours. I want to read from the book of Hebrews again in chapter 9, the the, the previous chapter there. It's not on the screen. It's kind of long, but it speaks to the same idea and how Jesus is the priest. 
that makes the sacrifice. Listen to what he says. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Essentially, he's talking about Christ himself as a tent, okay? He enters once and for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer satisfies, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offers himself without blemish to God, sinless, perfect, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. He goes on, therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant, Jesus, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from their transgressions committed under the first covenant. The first Mosaic covenant was a shadow. Jesus is fulfilling this. He is making it reality for us so that we might get the promised eternal inheritance inheritance that he has given to us. It is amazing. I'm going to go back one more chapter because what he did before that, he he talks about how this was actually prophesied. Now, this is when you know you can take Old Testament and, and say, yes, he was speaking about what was taking place because the New Testament writer does it, okay? So we can't always take everything that the Old Testament says and apply it to the New Testament, but in this case, we can. Listen to what he, the writer of Hebrews says out of the prophecy of Jeremiah. He said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which outly now does mean that it is Gentiles included, just so you know. Like a covenant that I made with my fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, throw I <laughs> was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the, that's the promise of the new covenant. That's the promise of what we celebrate every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It is an amazing, amazing covenant change that it takes place. And Luke describes it beautifully. In essence, what Jesus did on the cross and coming out of the grave is the fulfillment of fulfilling different but the older, the older covenant. He, he's, actually, he's actually fulfilling the oldest of covenants, which is the Abrahamic covenant, if you remember, where Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, was promised that he would be a blessing over all the earth. Let's just look at this verse again, one of my favorite Old Testament verses. I will bless those who bless you, and on him who dishonors you I will curse, and in, him, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And through Jesus Christ, through his lineage with Mary, through his lineage with, with Joseph, he is an heir, a relative. And in his family, the earth shall be blessed. What we celebrate when we come together to take the Lord's Supper, to have communion together, is so rich with history and meaning. It is the final covenant between God and man, and so much more. Let me, if I may, just kind of give you a a main idea for this whole text. It goes like this. Our God has created a new covenant by opening up the house of Israel to all who believe on the bread of life, writing in his law, writing his law on our hearts, and giving us a new celebration to remember the Lamb of God, whose sacrifice has taken away the sins of the world. 
Now, when you give a main point in a sermon, it, 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 it needs to be something you take home and you can remember. I'm not expecting you to memorize this. It's kind of long, but it's theologically rich, I believe. So let me tell you how you can remember this. Very simply, God loves, love runs deep. God's love runs deep. Remember that because it's so true. God love runs deep. In my study this week, oftentimes I'll find myself kind of veering into uh, the, the land of music, if you will. Not that I'm musical at all, but I love the old hymns. One of the hymns that kind of came to mind when I was singing, uh, going through this study is one called There Is a Fountain. So I've challenged our music team to, 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 to learn that. I, I only got this revelation like on Tuesday, so it was a little late for them to get it on the, on the parade today. But we'll sing it sometime here in the future, and it's just so rich with, with theology. But the, the first line, just listen to the first line of this hymn. It says, And there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Woo! Amen! That is amazing! It's exactly what takes place. And you know where, they got, you know where the, the author got that? From Scripture. It it, it actually comes out of Zechariah 13.1. Listen to what it says. It says, And on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. That is prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling when he goes to the cross and comes out of the grave. And that is what he's transforming that day, that Passover that was celebrating the freedom from Egypt. Now we celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion with the freedom from our own sin and fellowship with God. It is a wonderful, wonderful celebration that the door of forgiveness has been open, cleansing us from all our sin, making true the eternal promise of eternal life and entrance into the family of God. I, I want to look at the next few verses, and uh, they also are just of great significance as well. We'll look at verses 14 through 16, and it says, When an hour, the hour came, he reclined at table with his apostles with him, and he said to them, I earnestly desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Last week I showed you this picture of the, of the, the Lord's Supper and, and what it probably looked like. We can bring that up? Yeah, there you go. So uh, we looked at, at Da Vinci's picture, which is really beautiful painting, but not historically super accurate. This is probably a little bit more of what you saw in that upper room that day. The way they were reclining, there's, there, there's his, some historical evidence uh, to the shape of the table and the, and the way they did things. And, and so that's what was happening. Jesus was essentially leading what we refer to now as the Seder meal. And again, the Seder meal had particular order that took place. There were special lighting of candles and special items on the dinner plate, if you will. There were, there were uh, prayers and songs that were sung. All of it pointed back to what happened in Egypt and their freedom from that bondage. And there was also four cups of wine, each with their own special, special meaning. There was the cup the first cup, the cup of sanctification or the cup of blessing. There was the second cup referred to as the cup of plagues or the cup of judgment. There you would tell the story of what took place. There was the cup of redemption as well. And the last or final cup was the cup of praise or the the cup of Hallel. All four of those cups were, were done sequentially through the supper. What I find interesting here is that Luke, 
the Gentile writer, is the only one here that mentions a second cup. All the other gospel writers, all you hear about is the cups that we norm- the cup that we normally celebrate, just the one cup. I find it interesting. I believe what we just read was probably the first cup of this ceremony that was taking place, the cup of sanctification or the, the cup of blessing. What Jesus would have said and maybe did say this would be translated this way, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. That's the traditional blessing that would be part of this first cup of sanctification. But he may or may not have done it, I don't know. But what we do know is this. He says this, either in place of or afterwards, he took the cup and he had given thanks. So maybe he said that blessing right there. Take this and divide it amongst yourself. He passes it around to them. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The next two cups, the cup of plagues or judgments, the cup of redemption, the third cup, and then the last cup. I, again, I'm, I'm speculating somewhat here, but I, I, I think maybe, maybe he didn't do those cups. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We don't know. But what we do know is it seems like Christ fulfilled all the rest of the cups. When it comes to the cup of judgment, he took our judgment. The cup of redemption, we are redeemed. He paid the price on the cross. And so we celebrate, and he does the last cup, which we will do today. We refer to it as the the Lord's Supper, where the, the sinless blood of Christ atoned for our sins, blood spilt in judgment for our sins. It is the cup of redemption where he pays the penalty for us, because there's no Remission or forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. That's an Old Testament truth. And maybe this was, again, this last cup was this cup of Hillel or praise, which makes sense to me because wouldn't we be praising? Wouldn't we be praising because our sins are forgiven? Our penalty has been paid. Amen? Indeed. This is the Passover Jesus was involved with. And he says he will never celebrate it again until his kingdom comes. What kingdom is he talking about? (laughs) Well, depending on your eschatology and what you believe and how that lays out, that's a little bit up to you. But in general, there is this thing called the millennial kingdom. That is the reign of Christ for a thousand years where he comes and he reigns on the earth with his saints. Most people connect that reference to that occurrence because there's another thing called the marriage supper of the lamb that's mentioned in scripture that would tie into this time of celebration or maybe it's just when he creates the new heaven and the new earth i don't know for sure but we do know he's coming back and there is going to be a celebration and he's going to be celebrating together with us Ultimately, Jesus is saying there is a future coming that's what we do know the kingdom of god will be coming and just a side note, though, um, Jesus has now been a teetotaler for over 2,000 years. <laughs> just figured that out today. But as we go into this final part of the text today, let's, let's talk about what essentially would have taken place, or, or really what we know has taken place as Jesus transforms the Passover to the Lord's Supper. In verse 19, he said, He took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. The bread has been come to be known as the bread of affliction, referred to in the Seder meal. When they had the Seder meal, there was four questions that were asked throughout the meal and that were answered. It was kind of, it's a catechism, if you will, a learning and, and understanding and celebrating of what happened in the past through their release from Egypt. The first question that was always asked in this meal 
Again, I don't know if it's happened or not. But the first question would be, on all, the, all other nights we eat regular bread and matzah, why tonight do we only eat matzah or unleavened bread tonight? This would involve the story. Again, that there was, there was no time for yeast to be put into the dough and for the dough to rise. They, they had to do this very quickly. And again, this leaving out of this leaven, again, a symbolic representation of our sin, leaving that sin out, having that sin away from us, again, speaks to this whole idea of, of the sinful habits being left behind and the all the selfishness in our life and everything else, but living a holy life. I believe it's in the New Testament where it says, be holy as I am holy. And the only way we can be holy is because of the blood of Christ. One of the traditions within the Seder meal that took place, again, I don't know if Jesus did this for sure or not, but it's really quite interesting. They, They would have three pieces of matzah that would be wrapped together in a cloth. And they would take it, and the teacher would open up the cloth. And they would would pull out the bread that was in the middle. Okay? Now, from a Jewish perspective, there's a couple understandings of what this might be. This this might be the patriarchs, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. Many of them believe that's what that means. But from a Christian perspective... It certainly can mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because what they do when they do this ceremony, they take this out. And they put this down. And they break this piece in half. After they break it in half, they take it and they wrap it in a white cloth. My cloth's not quite big enough, I guess, but that's all right. Then they take it and they hide it. They have the children close their eyes. Again, this is what they're teaching history, is what they're doing to the kids during this meal. So they take it and they hide it. And then they take this piece and they pass it around. And they take and they eat of it. It is a, an amazing ceremony. When we look at the, the symbolism of the things that began to take place in this celebration, even to the point of what is a matzah cracker, okay? If you, you, I don't know if you can see it there, but, and I don't know if these were in their Jesus' matzah or not, but it slowly became these perforations in the cracker. Many believe this was, from a New Testament standpoint, the, the, the beatings of the whole of Christ that were taking place, the puncture of Christ that took place on the cross. The, the white cloth that the other one was wrapped in that represented Christ and put in a grave was, was literally put in a grave. His clothes, his, his, his grave clothes would have been white. All these things are symbolic understandings now from a, a Christian perspective that transformed in this ceremony. It's really quite amazing. Some of you saw what, we, what I just kind of demonstrated in more and better detail when we had the Seder last, this, earlier this year. And we'll do that again sometime as well. It is powerful. But the representation of Christ's body in this, in this bread, is exactly what we are to see. Because he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Matthew's gospel puts it this way. He says, and now they were eating Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This bread, the bread we'll take in just a moment, is a representation of Christ's body on the cross. His human body taking our human sin. Because he was one without sin. Just a little bit of teaching, if you will. Some of you know this, some of you may not, but 
the understanding of what we're going to celebrate in just a moment is looked at differently through different denominations. So the traditional Catholic view that's taken place is a, what is referred to as transubstantiation, okay, big word. And it literally means that the change or the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ and the whole substance of the wine into the substance of the blood, that this change literally metaphysically changes into the body of Christ, okay? The, the prayer, the, what they call the Eucharistic prayer, the prayer that would have been prayed, Eucharist just means Thanksgiving prayer, and you just heard he just gave thanks, right? Then transforms this. By the power of the, the words of the priest and the Holy Spirit, then this becomes literally the body of Christ. Same thing with the blood. They take the Catholics, the, they view this from a lot from John chapter 6. If you read John chapter 6, it'll blow your mind, by the way, if you haven't read it in a long time. But it talks very specifically about um, statements Jesus makes about saying, you have to eat my body and you have to drink my blood if you're going to have life. <laughs> That's what it says. Another view is a, a Lutheran view, a, a little bit what they call to a, le a lesser view of the substances. This was promoted by Martin Luther, the reformer. It's referred to as consubstantiation, not transubstantiation, but consubstantiation, where the presence, Christ's presence is element, or Christ's presence is in the elements, but the elements did not transform. A little bit different. The third view is referred to usually as a memorial view that draws on the phrases in Luke and Paul when they do the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. I would add, though, while we take a, what would be considered a more memorial view of this ceremony, that I would add that there is, there is real presence of Christ with us and with the bread and with the juice as we remember. The reason I say that is because of the omniscience, or not omni, omnipresence of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We know two things very clearly from, from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that is that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. We have God in us, and that God is everywhere, omnipresent. And so when we celebrate this, it should be done in reverence, it should be done in honor, it should be done with the knowledge of the fact that, in a, I believe in a special way, the presence of God is with us as we take communion together. That whole night, that, that evening, there was so much more that took place. The, the washing of the disciples' feet, right? The, the arguments that took place about who's greater, and we'll talk about that next week. There's this teaching that goes on and on about who God is and how He's going to send the Holy Spirit and it's just truly an amazing night. And Jesus' deep desire was to do this, to have this, this ceremony and transform this ceremony. It is a most important time in history for them and for us. It was the last Passover meal and the first communion. It is the now once and for all sacrifice Jesus has fulfilled the Passover and now is fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. And even though he knows what's immediately going to happen to him, he looks forward to the new kingdom that is to come. You see, God instituted the old covenant, didn't he? And he's the only one that can change in the new covenant, into a new covenant. And he does that through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 Paul writes about this. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? That, that Greek word translated here, participation, is also translated communion, okay? We get that idea, uh, or that word communion from here as well. 
But it, what it really stresses is communal benefit. When he says participation and when he says communion together, it is there is a communal benefit that he's talking about that takes place when the body of Christ comes together and does what we're going to do in just a few minutes. There is a benefit that takes place as we take the body and blood together. Each and every one of us who believe in the death and the burial resurrection of Jesus are cleansed from our sins by the shedding of his blood. He is our perfect lamb of God. And Christ's body, the perfect, perpetual, sinless sacrifice, there has to be no other, never again. He has done it. So I want to answer just one quick question quickly before we, we celebrate here in just a moment. And the question simply is this, why would Jesus want us to regularly remember the new covenant by celebrating the Lord's Supper or communion? Why would he want us to do that? I can think of a host of reasons, and we could be here all day, but I know you don't want to do that, and I don't either, to be honest with you. But let me give you three. Let me give you three reasons why he remembers, he wants us to remember this and celebrate this with honor and dignity and reverence. Number one, it keeps us humble, folks. This ceremony keeps us humble because we understand that we cannot save ourselves. None of our good works, even the good works of God and and, and God-ordained animal sacrifice was not enough. It took Jesus. And folks, that's very humbling. And the truth is, we still sin. Even though we believe and we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, we still sin. So we don't have to put Christ up on the cross another time, per se, but we do have to go to Him in confession. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It gives us this humble ability to come to Christ and ask for forgiveness anytime we sin. It keeps us humble. Number two, it reminds us our freedom from sin was not free. Our freedom from sin was not free. It cost the Father his son. Could you imagine losing your own son? To leave the glories of heaven, to come on earth and die the way he died. No greater love, right? The supper should always lead us back to that, to the cross. Every time we take the supper, our hearts and our minds should be focused on the broken body and the blood that was shed in remembrance of all he has done for us. Number three, it communicates that we are perfectly loved. Folks, you and I love each other. I might love my wife really well, but we love it imperfectly. I may love my children really well, but we love imperfectly, don't we? But God, (laughs) he loves perfectly. He says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than someone that lays down his life for his friends. And really the emphasis of that passage or that section there is that he calls us friends. (laughs) He calls us friends. And he laid down his life for us. Jesus threw himself on that grenade, if you will. We see it in the movies. But more than that, he went to a cross, willingly, knowingly, to die for us. Folks, with all that background today, I hopefully maybe some new and deeper insight into our understanding on how we gather here in just a moment. And as we see in our text and this ceremony, um, this was not a public display. This was a private meeting with his 12 apostles. The reason I mention that is because the celebration of the Lord's Supper is for the church. It is for God's people that have trusted him and have a relationship with him. And so if you're here today and you don't have that relationship quite nailed down yet, you're wondering or you don't know for sure, I would ask you to just abstain and to sit back and to watch 
and to even pray. But see how we celebrate. Now, if you're here and you're, you're a believer in Jesus Christ from another church or wherever, you're welcome. And we ask you to participate in the Lord's Supper today. The way we're going to do this um, is, in a moment, um, we'll pass out the elements. In fact, the ushers I've asked to go ahead and pass out these elements, uh, please come up and I'll, I'll pray and then we'll pass out the elements. But They'll pass out both elements to you. You'll get the juice and you'll get the bread. Once you have both of those and they've come back and sat down, I will lead us together in taking um, the Lord's Supper together. So pray with me if you would. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Luke's telling of this story. It is amazing what you have done and what you have left for us to remember and that you have given us this gift for the church to commune and to participate in this incredible remembrance that your body was broken for us. It hung on a cross. It was pierced for our transgressions. And your blood ran from your veins ultimately covering the mercy seat of God, satisfying the wrath of a holy God, so that our sins may be covered and our sins may be taken from the, as far as the east is from the west, that we can find forgiveness and relationship in the internal promises of life with you everlasting. It is with that in our heart of seeking you, and a heart of, of remembering our own sins and confessing them to you, that we take these elements, that we celebrate this wonderful and beautiful ceremony that you've left for us today. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.